Good night and welcome to Tech Talk. I'm your guest host, Andrea Pitts. We continue hearing about climate change. In fact, we are experiencing it. Weather patterns continue to change. Storms are becoming increasingly intense. And right here in Belize, we are experiencing record droughts. These things put not only our land at risk, but also our food. But there are some good news. For instance, technology is being employed in Belize to guide the policy that can contribute to food security and proper land use. To find out more, I'd like to welcome to our show, Mr. Jose Alpuche, CEO in the Ministry of Agriculture, and Ms. Milagro Matos, a policy analyst. Welcome to Tech Talk. Thank you for having us. Good night. Can you kindly tell our viewers a little bit about all that the Ministry of Agriculture is responsible for in Belize and what you do? Well, for us, it's the overall uh, policy guidance um, regulating, but al also providing services to the agriculture sector, um, overseeing BAHA, which is the Agriculture Health Authority Pesticide Control Board, okay. and the board governing the industries. So we have quite a wide um, responsibility. Okay. Um, spanning the entire country from north to south, east to west. Okay, and Milagre, sounds like you have to examine a lot of data. Can you tell us about what you are responsible for? Well, I'm responsible for the statistics unit and also for a public-private sector interface. So indeed, we have a lot of data in the country of Belize for agriculture. Okay. okay, good. So as I've said in the introduction, the ministry is utilizing technology in response to climate change. But in the greater scope of things, as you've just heard, they have a large portfolio of responsibilities. The ministry is pursuing a comprehensive digitizing of their ministry. So before we hear directly from our guests, let's take a look at a brief overview of what they're doing. To transform the way the Ministry of Agriculture and the agriculture sector as a whole work, and to provide farmers and stakeholders with the enabling data environment necessary for growth and development, the ministry is digitizing agriculture. The ministry's boldest move towards digitization is that of using technology to facilitate the collection and dissemination of accurate agriculture data necessary for proper decision making. Adopting advanced technologies to counter the significant challenges posed in increasing productivity, mitigating climate change, and securing market access, it designed a system to support these activities. In all, the digitization of the Ministry of Agriculture will provide quality, accurate, and timely data and services to the farmers. Together, these activities should increase the competitive advantage of farmers and, more importantly, increase their earned income. The true value of, of digitization is that you collect base, in, base information and then that information can be used for multiple applications. Uh, you know now in Belize you have a growing uh, number of young people developing apps, so the possibilities become endless. A lot of the uses we don't even know as yet, but if we have that, that base information, that is what will, be, will allow agriculture to move forward. It saves us time, saves us money, and we will be able to respond fairly quickly to the needs and provide far better services to the farmers. Well, that sounds certainly interesting. So, can you tell us what is the extent of this digitizing? Well, what we saw just now was one strand of what, strand of what we're trying to do. There's also the strand in terms of uh, management and, and human resource okay. management and administration. Okay. There's also two financial management and then this, the economic okay. side, to deliver services, better services to pharma, farmers. At the core, though, is the collecting um, uh, and analyzing of quite a lot of data. Okay. Um, for that, we have beams and other systems that we're utilizing in terms of data collection. We're also, we're also looking at implementing new, new tools, um, uh, satellite remote sensing, wow. um, and some other things that we have planned that we're working on right now to truly bridge the gap of uh, the ministry's ability to provide better service to the sector. Okay, great. And so from a technology standpoint, 
Um, does this involve a lot of new hardware and physical components, or is this mostly app-based and um, web-based software? I wouldn't think it's just web and app-based. Um, okay. While we have beams to collect information, there are, lot, there are a lot of new technologies that we're impl implementing okay. um, at, the, at the field level. No? So we have the irrigation systems, the fertigation systems, we have the cover structures, we have technologies that in terms of small scale equipment that we are introducing to farmers. So there is a lot that's being done okay. apart from the technology in terms of applications and apps. Okay. But also too, we're depending on, on third parties to provide us with support. Um, for example, the climate change office, the five C's, um, should be doing a LIDAR survey of the yeah. country to collect digital yeah. uh, topographic information, yeah. which would feed directly into uh, our ability to prov to articulate, to develop and articulate and implement a national uh, drainage and irrigation plan. So okay. it's a very, very broad range of, of technologies we're, we're implementing. Some of it in-house, some of it provided by uh, third parties. Okay, excellent. And so I understand that one of the um, main things you're introducing is the BAMS, the Belize Agricultural Information Management System. So of course, I'd love for you to tell our viewers more about that. But first, we'd just like to show them a quick video that has an overview of it. In July 2018, with the support of the Inter-American Development Bank, the ministry launched the Belize Agriculture Information Management System, BAMES, a government-owned, web-based application that serves as a central repository for data collection and dissemination. We're using technologies this, this year to be able to deliver better services to our farmers. Um, we are intending to register farmers, first of all, so we're giving them a, a national farmer's ID. The data that we are collecting will be able to support farmers um, in being able to access the domestic market. So we will have data on projections of production. We'll be able to manage supply and demand of production. We'll be able to support farmers in times of um, natural disasters. Be able to advise them um, appropriately in relation to climate change. We would be able to increase our um, surveillances for pest and disease, and we'll be able to monitor land um, use changes. And we're working on that to collect uh, georeference data of the farms and information on the farms. We would be able, hopefully, in the not too distant future to do forecast supply balances, something that Belize has never done before. And quite frankly, very few countries of our size have that capability. We're working on, on some commercial uh, uh, platforms, um, which should help everybody, should bring the farmer closer to the consumer um, and, in effect, make business happen much more efficiently, much more effectively, much more competitive for the, for the farmers and food producers. The information would be useful to the ministry to make decisions and as well as farmers for them to make decisions. At the macro level, we would be able to identify the true objective contribution, socioeconomic contribution of agriculture to employment, national accounts, GDP. Um, in addition to that, we would be able to render services to the farmers in what is exactly their needs. Okay, very good once again. So I have to ask, what led to this being even conceptualized and what are the goals intended? Proper data for proper decision okay. making. Okay. Uh, for too many years, we've been taking decisions based on guesstimates. Okay. And while it has worked, it's not as precise as we absolutely need to. The other thing is we have uh, about 10,000 farmers spread out across the country and less than 100 technical people to provide service yeah. to them. So okay. we had to apply. It was not okay. a question of if. We absolutely had to apply okay. uh, digital applications that could help us collect data, retrieve data, analyze and disseminate data far quicker. That's why we've, we've taken digitization okay. as a core of what we, what we need to do. Okay, so in thinking about this, it sounds like this um, service requires a lot of data, and of course, that data needs to be input by people. So, um, so far, how successful have you been in getting the farmers to buy into this program? We have been successful. 
We, okay. could, we could be better, of course. Okay. Um, to date, we have registered about 7,000 farmers. Okay, so that's um, about 70%. That's okay. very, that's and a high rate. 8,000 farms. Excellent. So um, we have had a good turnout, of course. We, we intend to get more farmers involved. We have a strong sensitization campaign. Okay. And we also visit the village um, leaders, communities, and it, we okay. encourage people to, to register. And we also explain to them the benefits of registering. Okay. And how long did it take to get that many farmers um, participating? It took us um, three months in every district. Wow. Yes, yeah, so we, we ran a year, a year's time to collect all the data, but we went three months, three months, three months into each district. Okay, that's very good. I think you guys should lead the next national census. <laughs> <laughs> that's and a far beyond the <laughs> Yes. So during this process, what were some of the, um, the typical questions that the farmers would have? Well, there was a lot of concern in regard to the use of the data. Is it going to be for taxes? Um, okay. uh, you know, <laughs> sensitive okay. questions, they were very concerned about um, that the use and the confidentiality of the information. Okay. So we had, to, um, we had to communicate with them a lot to ensure that the data will be used only for the purposes of doing forecast supply balances okay. and to support them in times of, um, of, of need, right? So um, those were basically our, our biggest challenges was the fact that the confidentiality of the data. Okay, and CEO, you mentioned that um, before the ministry's policy making was based on guessing in many instances, but now on this proper data that you have collected. Can you share examples of how this data has been used in actual policy decision? Um, as it is right now, um, we're going through a drought. Yeah. We're looking at utilizing beams as part of the data collection. Um, we, over a period of time, the whole idea is that over a period of time and we, we have uh, sufficient cycles, production cycles of, of data, we'd be able to look at the individual, at the community, at the macro level, okay, um, the impact, so, and analyze through the, the, the platform why certain producers are, um, are not, either not producing or overproduce or producing more than expected. So it gives us a tool that we're able to to do the analysis and provide feedback to the farmers. Okay. But as it is right now, one of the, one of the most important bit of it is the georeferencing of the farms. We now know the physical location of the farms. Uh, so in the case of disaster, in the case of an okay. outbreak, so you know who's and affected even in the case of marketing, okay. we'd be able to say if farmer X wants to sell us, um, has a particular product for, for sale, we could actually have a, a, a georeference that you could use on your, on your phone to find him. So it will, the utility of what we're doing right now, the foundation information that we're collecting right now, will span just about... And feed into new services that you could offer. Endless. Quite frankly, mm -hmm. endless as we go developing them. Yes. Okay, excellent. And so you mentioned drought, and of course that feeds into the wider conversation of climate change, which is caused in many instances by human action. So how can a service like this improve um, land use and better water management? First and foremost, I think this will give us a, a network, a system in which we can communicate with the farmers easier. Um, it is still being developed. We're actually utilizing this digitization to drive uh, cluster formation, group formation, which is one of the always has been a challenge at the farm level to, to get the farmers to collaborate. This uh, platform will actually, instead of, of clusters taking us to digitization, digitization will take us to clusters. Okay, right. So it will help us to organize the farmers uh, better to be able to communicate with them better. Um, that, that in and of itself uh, uh, presents tremendous value both to the ministry and, and to the farmers. The ability to communicate, the ability for us to, okay. to share data, climate, related, okay. press related, market related. Okay. And so um, just for the benefit of our, of our viewers, just how important is water management and land usage during this time of drought? Absolutely critical. Um, it is at the center of, of what we're planning to do. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, we need the topographic maps. Right now, Belize has to, uh, topographic maps that are one in 20 in terms of okay. the, the topographic information. Our um, digit digital maps could literally provide us one in one. So 
a very, very detailed map. There's already computer modeling software with which we can do planning for both water collection, water harvesting, okay. um, and for drainage. Okay. Um, so this information, um, well, with the digital information, we have to wait on the Excellent. survey from climate um, from five Cs, um, but that will then put us at a at a different level as it relates to to um, providing um, both physical in terms of physical planning um, for drainage and irrigation. The whole water management concept, of course, going further than you have uh, precision agriculture, utilizing sensors in your soil okay. to determine the correct amount of watering, when to water. And all of these information are integrated into the BIMS? We will have, we will have all of it okay. uh, interconnected. Okay, that's but good. I must say some of this is, okay. is uh, a bit down the, down, down okay. the road. And when it comes to these digital um, technology and applications, just like the internet is important to have a wide scope of integration. So I just have to ask, um, what's the degree of integration between what you have going on at the ministry and other agencies such as the five Cs? One of the, I think it's on Thursday, the Belize National Spatial Data yes. Infrastructure will be launched. Yes. Um, we will be providing data sets for that. and. Um, I, I, to explain it in layman's terms, it's sort of Google map, but specific to Belize, where yeah. you'd be able to look at the georeference, and from there, all the layers of information you'd be able to, to, to capture based on a particular reference. For agriculture, it will be very important. Um, coupled with our, um, our, the farm location, the farmer identification, then comes the agronomic information in terms of output. You're also looking at, at land information. Yes. Of course, not all of this will yes. be yes. available to the public because some of yes. it is confidential. But the elements that will be made available to the public will give the public and the, 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 the farmers in our case far better um, data to look at their surroundings, okay. plan their surroundings, okay, etc. Okay, excellent. So. In this road to digitizing the ministry, one of the coolest things that we've heard about so far is the virtual marketplace for the farmers, which is like the Belize brand sale version of farmersonly.com. <laughs> so viewers, let's take a look at that before we hear more. Dubbed Belize's very own agriculture Craigslist, the Agriculture Virtual Trading Platform is another important digital platform that will be used parallel to BEAMS. So the Belize virtual trading platform is a platform where um, buyers and producers would be able to communicate. So if you have 10 chickens, you put up uh, the pictures of the 10 chickens, you say who you are as a farmer and where your produce is located. So it's basically bridging the gap of finding a market for the, for the, the farmer. Um, the importance of the system is really you're trying to remove the middleman, increase the real income of the farmer, and of course having data, production data accessible real time to all those interested in purchasing products. There's going to be a mobile application and a web-based application separate for the access of that data. To collect the necessary data, the Ministry began its National Agriculture Census in August 2018 using tablets, Enumerators and extension officers are collecting information from farming communities. The exercise is expected to conclude in June 2019. The intention, of course, is to keep the data up to date and accurate for us to be able to make decisions, and of course the farmers as well. And the intention is for us to have continuous production surveys based on the production cycle of the commodity. The data would only be aggregated in terms of the, the BAMES results, in terms of production, who produces where, how much, it would be aggregated. So you just get um, total production of tomatoes in Belize is this amount. And it would be accessible through the web-based uh, Ministry of Agriculture website. So very good. This, is one, this one is really cool and very practical, I must say. I <laughs> And so has this service been launched as yet? No, it's still in the development phase. We intend to launch it ending September. OK, mm -hmm. excellent. And so what are some of the anticipated benefits of this excellent service? Well, um, the signing up to, to AgriLinks is, is free. Okay. So the farmer would have free access to the system. 
and we invite farmers as well as persons who are interested in buying hotels. Um, and me and you are interested yeah. in buying docks. We can go up to this platform and register and be able to access the system. Um, the benefit, one of the biggest benefits of the system, it's real-time data. Okay. So at any okay. point in time when you go there, you you can you will get information that um, that is reliable and up to date as okay. compared to like Facebook when you go on it and you buy and sell, for example, you go on it, something might have already been sold, and it's still up on on the on the portal, right? Okay, I understand. Mm -hmm. And where will um, people be able to access this? Will it be on the Google Play Store and App World? Yes, and it will be on okay. Google. It would be on your um, Apple, what do you call it? Apple's uh, Play Store. Apple Store. Apple, and Apple App Store. Store. Uh -huh. yes. And um, we also have the, the web-based version. So you have it on app okay. and the web-based. So you can decide what you want to so do. So everyone will be able to have access. It. Yes. OK. Mm -hmm. And with the georeference nature of this, again, you will know whether or not what you want to buy, how far it is from you. OK. So beyond only the knowledge that it's available, okay. you will know the precise location where you could actually obtain it. So if you're in Stan Creek, you won't try to purchase your two pounds of onions from Corozal. That's right. That's right. You'll <laughs> find somewhere in Stan Creek that you could, you could access it okay. uh, near, nearest to you. In addition to CEO's um, comment is the fact that um, we are advertising or marketing local products. So right. local processed products, local raw products. It's locally made, so you are not going up there to find anything that's and organic. imported. <laughs> there is also a section for organic. Um, we have an employment section, so if you're interested in find, finding people, um, you, you're interested in employing or looking for a job, you can go up there and find it as well. Okay, excellent. And so when it comes to things like this, um, technology is a big component of this entire service, but another big component is marketing. So how does the ministry market this service to the farmers and how does it market this to clients who will be the users of the app? We have been, uh, throughout the year, been marketing both BIMS and AgriLinks. Um, I think BIMS, even before AgriLinks, we have been doing um, community sessions, a lot of m sensitization through the media and, and with farmers, discussions with farmers and when farmers see the advantages of something, they speak to each other and they, Eventually, everybody wants to, to join the, the okay. bandwagon, right? So, um, for example, BIMS, we have, uh, we have personnel just walking into the office wanting to register. Okay, okay. So people start looking for you when they see the importance of the product. AgriLinks, for example, as soon as I, I mention it in any forum, um, everybody wants to know. Everybody wants to be involved. So I believe that, yes, um, Right now, we haven't launched it officially, but when okay. we do, we'll be going full speed in terms of sensitization, going to all the media houses. But as is right about now, for those who know that it's in the development process, okay. people are extremely excited. And can we expect for it to be launched within this year or the next year? September, ending September, we intend okay. to, to have it launched. The thing is, we are intending to do AgriLinks both in Spanish and English, so because we understand our yeah. The diversity. Correct. Yeah. And so um, that is that we want to be fully prepared before we launch. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. And so right now your ministry is digi digitizing, but in the greater country we are undergoing a digital transformation. So in your experience, you've said that you spent three months in each district promoting this and getting the farmers involved. Can you share about um, the access to internet? Do these are these farmers connected online, which of course would enable them to enable them to take advantage of this AgriLinks app? There are some limitations, um, but I must say coverage, uh, especially by mobile phone, has gotten okay. uh, much much better now. Okay. But you do have areas uh, in remote um, uh, Toledo, for example, where you would pick up more uh, Guatemalan. Okay. Uh, site than uh, uh, reception okay. than than Belize, but overall um, it, um, it it it's accessible. What we also do have do it are our extension offices in the various districts and the whole concept of the cluster um, groups to be able to feed the information uh, into the system. Um, it will be necessary for the farmers to register because. Uh, as I said, because we're georeferencing, because there's no double counting, because we're using the technology now, um, this will become the official um, list of recognized farmers by, okay. by the ministry. Um, 
we're not coming down hard and fast on that because with all these technologies, um, there's always a, a curve for, for acceptance and adaptation. And we believe over time it, it, it will span the span 100 percent, but Got it will it. take a little bit of time to, 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 to get it uh, fully functional. Okay. And based, up, based on what I've read about the app, which is still in the development stage, it will allow the farmers to advertise their produce and people interested to go online, see what they want, know who is selling it, and order it. Do you intend to incorporate one day a um, payment solution so that the entire transaction can be completed right there within the app, the payment and everything right there and then? Actually, the system was developed like that. Okay. Yeah, and we had to do modifications because, okay. you know, that's not Are accessible right about content? now. Okay. Yeah, so it is something in the pipelines. I, we're hoping that um, the, the financial future. institutions can catch up with us and okay. we can I, get I that I think done. a reality too that we have to uh, understand is that a lot of the smaller farmers are not even in the banking system. That's true. Okay. Um, so there's another program being run in conjunction with the central bank as it relates to trying to bring them into the formal uh, banking system. So we're working at multiple levels with multiple agencies to really create a, an environment where, where the digitization efforts will, will reach everybody in, in okay. hopefully the, the, the not too distant future. Okay, excellent. So my final question that I want to ask, um, we see that the big farms in Belize are willing and able to invest into technology to improve efficiency and productivity at their farms. So your ministry is digitizing, so it seems that you have grasped the benefits of technology. So does your ministry take an active role in encouraging the smaller farmers to um, take a risk, maybe they see it as a risk, but to make that leap in um, investing in more technology into their farms? Believe me, a lot of the smaller farmers are waiting patiently, especially as Milagro mentioned, for the, um, for the uh, agri-links, because they see this as a tool with which they would not have to leave their farm to come to Belize City to sell something where they could actually do uh, pre-selling of Great. produce. Mm -hmm. So they're waiting for it as and much that, as I am. And, and that offers a lot of cost savings because precisely, transportation precisely. is uh, one of the major expenses. And, and a lot of them have access to the cell phone yes. and they're switched on and waiting. And their kids too. I mean, nearly everybody yeah. has a Facebook account. Correct. I mean, Valley of Peace has a Valley of Peace Farmers group Correct. on Facebook. So we, we, we shouldn't underestimate them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I wanted to mention one thing before we, we end. Both the BIMS, the uh, information management system, the agriculture information management system, and AgriLinks uh, were developed in-house. When I say, sorry, not in-house, in in-country. Excellent. A um, uh, firm out of uh, Corozol, KYN, did beams. We're quite satisfied with what they've done. So very competent local app developers. Extremely, developers. extremely competent, flexible, That's great and they're, they're in-country. So mm -hmm. it's, it's very cost-effective to work with them. Great. Of course, they came in at, at a far more reasonable price than an international firm producing the same quality at a much reduced price, both in terms of development, but in terms of the, in terms of the ongoing support. So we want to encourage those that are looking at digitization Correct. to look local. There's Correct. a lot of uh, uh, possibilities local. And then AgriLinks was developed by Mr. Noble, Mr. Noble in Cayo. Not a Belizean, right here yes. in Belize. Precisely. We okay. had a lot of consult, um, consultants applying, and we encourage people to use our local consultants. They're as good or even better. Okay. And what is important. That's definitely great to hear. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to import all technology. Mm -hmm. No, none at all. Um, there's quite a bit. And look, this is this, the, the whole digital world is the future. Correct. So we've got to give opportunities to our local people to get the experience, to be able to develop the expertise, and to right. continue providing us uh, uh, excellent service. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you thank both you, very much for your contribution and appearance. It's, you shared very exciting news, and so we thank you for appearing on Tech Talk. Thank, thank you for you having too. us. No problem. And so, viewers, we are now at the end of our first half of BizTech, but stay tuned because after this commercial break, we return with more. Tech Talk is brought to you by the Public Utilities Commission.
Welcome back to Tech Talk, our one hour of tech lingo and advancements broken down into understandable bytes. I'm your guest host tonight, Anja Pitts. Earlier, we were joined by representatives from the Ministry of Agriculture who told us how technology is connecting farmers to their customers while also providing data that guides policy decisions as we continue combating climate change. Now we are joined by Mr. Etienne Sharp to discuss a massive change that is coming to what we know as the internet. Etienne, welcome. Thank you very much, Andre. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Yeah, <clears throat> so this evening the big topic is um, IPv6 and okay. why do so, you need it in your life? So Etienne, I know you're excited, but sure. before we get into the internet, let's go to this week's installment of, biz of Street Tech, sorry. What type of network must a person access in order to send an encrypted email? Is it A, an intranet, B, the internet, or C, a local area network? C, local area network. Um, B, internet. Uh, I think it's just the internet, B. Internet. Internet. A, intranet. A local area network? C, local area network. What type of communication will send a message to all devices on a network? Is it A, broadcast, B, multicast, or C, all cast? A, a broadcast. A, a broadcast. A, broadcast. 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 B, multicast. Multicast. B. It's B. B, multicast. Yeah. Multicast. What does IP stand for? Is it A, internet ping? B, Internet Protocol, or C, Internet Patrol? Internet Protocol. Internet Protocol, B. Internet Protocol. Internet Ping? B, Internet Protocol. B, Internet Protocol. Internet Protocol, B. B, Internet Protocol. Okay, so one thing I know for sure is that Etienne would have gotten all of those questions correct. But for the benefit of our viewers, to send an encrypted email, you would still use the internet. To send a message to all devices on a network, you would use a broadcast. And of course, IP stands for Internet Protocol, and you're about to get an advanced course in that, thanks to Etienne. <laughs> so Etienne, can you tell us who you are here to represent and the type of work that you do with them? So um, I, I wear a couple of hats, but the main ones at the moment are um, the ICT Association, okay. as well as, um, and that is basically a group of like-minded people who our um, basic goal is to push everything ICT uh, within Belize. Um, the other one hat is um, as the coordinator for the Belize in the Internet Exchange Point, okay. which was something we've done before, which is um, was several years in the making, but we're already seeing the fruits here in Belize okay. with respect to that. Uh, generally, I do IT consulting. I have a, a small company of my own that do IT consulting. But those are the two main things right now that we're, that we're pushing really hard in terms of that. In regards to the ICT community in Belize, is that a big network? It's growing. I mean, <clears throat> you have to remember ICT. It's everything from a student yeah, who is studying anything to okay. do with ICT to any practitioner of, of, of ICT in terms of uh, people working in telecom, people working in um, support companies like full tech, um, just about everybody, including, I mean, the, the layman in the street that actually uses ICT on a day-to-day -day basis, you know? Um, it's, it's all considered ICT, but in terms of the ICT professionals uh, um, association, it's the, it's the sort okay. of professionals. In okay, so now when it comes to internet protocol IP, at least for me, this is one of the more complex areas in technology. Although I know the name is still very difficult to grasp what it all means. So can you assist me and the viewers when it comes to that? Sure, and I think that the segment should be more about um, relating to, to, to users and how it works. So the, the internet protocol itself, um, it actually came from um, uh, US Department of Defense initiative, uh, we talked in the 70s. Um, where um, a few engineers got together, were funded by the US government, to figure out a better way to, um, to make uh, defense infrastructure more resilient, more, more um, okay. uh, um, basically resilient in, within the network. And a couple people who people have never heard of, um, like uh, Vin 
Seth and Bob Kahn, uh, they are known as the, the father of the internet. Yeah, they actually okay. were one of the instrumental people in writing TCP IP, which is the, the, the stack that we call the, the internet protocol stack. This is the main internet protocol stack that we use today. So in terms of different things you might hear, you might things, hear things like the layer, which layer it is, it works at within the OSI model and stuff, which is seven layers. So sorry. Sure, go on. Yeah. <laughs> when it comes to, so this IP, is this a set of codes? Is it a it technology? Is, is it a it, hardware? It is actually the IP protocol itself is a group of protocols. It's just not one. Okay. Um, and and this means guidelines. What does it refer to? Um, so, very good question. So the internet itself is governed initially by by well by ISOC, which is the Internet Society. Again, was founded by some of these guys, some of these fathers. Wow. Um, and you have something called, the, the, on the technological side, to decide how the stack changes, how it evolves, um, is the Internet Engineering Task Force, which comes under ISOC. You have some other policy-based um, um, organizations, like the Internet Governance Forum, which is actually part of the UN. And they deal with more policy on a, on, a, okay. on a sort of governmental and global side of things of how, they go, how the internet will grow. And then the IETF basically takes care of the technical side. So like everything else, the policy dictates how we're going to grow. Sometimes one pushes wow. the other. So um, IP is not just one thing. Yeah? IP is a whole, a, whole, a whole set of things. Okay. Um, so I really thought that the internet was just a free for all. You get your internet connection, you log on and do as you please. So you're saying that the internet is actually governed by a body. Is this a sovereign body? Does it it's come under the FBI not, or not. somebody else? A very good question. And, and, and some of it still comes under some American-led organizations like ICANN that is more to do with um, uh, names registry and DNS and stuff like that, which is a total different segment we can do. Um, but yes, the beauty is that the internet itself is not governed by any one. It should be technically be under the UN. Although an icon okay. will be turned over to the UN eventually, okay. but at the moment, um, essentially the internet was something invented by the Americans, and hence they still feel the need to kind of hold on a little bit okay. hard to this kind <laughs> and of. And was thing. that invention accidental when it comes to what we know as the internet today? How it grew, how it grew, and how it evolved was very much community-led. Okay. So meaning that people, programmers around the world is what really pushed how the internet okay. grew and how it, how it um, evolved. Um, when it comes to, 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 the, to the initial framework, um, like I mentioned before, that was DOD-led okay. and Department of Defense, US okay. Defense-led. That was initial funding. And then after that, it became, it went into universities, MIT, um, GTEC, Georgia Tech, uh, Virginia Tech, these big, these big um, universities invested huge amounts of money into, um, into research. And then, and from those, from that is where where the internet came. So, um, IPv4, for example, that we're that we're evolving from, we're talking about IPv6 yes, today. Yes. That 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 started around 1974. Wow. You know, took a long time to actually it's still in existence. Yes, and for example, IPv6, which we'll speak about today, initially was a, was a white paper that was written in 1988, if I'm not mistaken, and it wasn't ratified until 19 okay. until 2017. Okay. Um, and the reason for that being is because it's such a it's something that affects the entire world. Okay. So you have, as you can imagine, we have so many people who have to agree to this. Okay. Yeah. It's almost like trying to decide climate change. Okay. You know, um, uh, a lot of people have to say yes, and a lot of compromises are made in, in that process. You know. Okay. But um, to get us back on track to where we were, so yeah, the IP protocol itself is not just one protocol, it's, it's, it's a group of protocols. And IP itself works at the OSI, what they call the OSI level three, or layer three, yeah? Now, just give, give you some idea of what you can touch. As you can touch it, it's layer one. Okay. So even if you can't touch it, because wireless is still layer one, okay. and layer two. Okay. Uh, layer three is what comes right above it. So to give you a quick sort of synopsis of what happens at layer three, is basically um, three things mainly. Uh, packetizing information to decide what the source was, what the destination is, and then based on some other small metrics to decide which path you take to get okay. to where you need to go. And so if I could take a shot at translating that for our viewers at home, 
you're saying that um, this means that if I am using my computer and I want to watch um, Angry Birds on YouTube, so my computer would be the source and Angry Birds on YouTube would be the destination. And that is correct. How I get there is the path. Correct. Okay. Good so, guess. <laughs> excellent. Actually, excellent. Be better than me. <laughs> but so, and to give you an idea of where we are today for most of us, which is IPv4 okay. compared to IPv6. Um, think of IPv4 as being um, the bus. So I want to get to Barango. Yes, the bus goes there. But I have to catch that bus, go to Belize City, Belize City go to Belmopan, Belmopan to Griga, Griga go PG, PG go Barranco. Yeah? Commercial man, long. Correct. So think about um, IPv6, not so directly, but it's almost like grabbing Astrum helicopters and going directly through my uncle. Okay, yeah? great. So the path is a lot quicker. The, the actual protocol stock, believe it or not, you would th the, the actual protocol itself you would think would be more complex is actually less complex in some ways. Great. But it does add layers of different types of addressing. So when we talk about source and destination addressing, it's just that. The internet protocol has, here we go, IPv6, IPv4 comparison table. So one of the big things that IP6 gives us is almost an infinite amount of, of, um, of, of um, IP addresses. Uh, IPv4 led 4.3 billion, and considering how many people we have in the world, exactly. that's not even one for everybody in the world. Okay. To put it in perspective... So IPv6 is necessary. Uh, extremely necessary. Um, to put it in perspective, you can probably give every grain of sand in the world an IP6 address, and you'd wow. still have some left over. Wow. Yeah, it's just the, 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 the space is just... It, it, it's mind-boggling in terms of that. So I don't even, even try to think about it. Um, in terms of more technical parts, yes, you have uh, one's, one's 32-bit, one's 128-bit. And to give you an idea what that means is every bit you add. So from 32-bit to 33 bits, I double. I go to, I, instead of 4.3 billion, I have 8.6 billion. So you can imagine by the time you, you double that how many times mm -hmm. to get up to all, all the way up to 128. Okay. And then you have, you have some stuff. Yeah, you have some stuff that um, that works um, really well with. Um, sorry, one, one of the other things that it brings to it is is integrated security. So before, because like I said, IPv4 um, layered itself. It, you you add IPv4 and then you layer different things on top. IPv6 okay. comes with IPsec inbuilt. In, so okay. what that means is okay. that I can make a, a more direct connection, but not only a more direct connection, but more a more secure, secure connection. Okay. Yeah? You, 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 you hear a lot today, um, especially within um, chat, chat, um, um, pro, chat protocols of end-to-end -end In, encryption. Okay. Yes? So this is the kind of thing that okay. IPv6 actually allows very easily and okay. a lot more securely. So if you're using IPv4, more times than no, you need to go securely to a server somewhere and then back down towards. Okay. But IPv6, you go exactly Directly. end to end. This is sounding more and more like the Department of Defense indeed. <laughs> and so I want to ask, is the IPv6 related in any way to 5G? You mentioned that this would give much faster connection since it makes it less cumbersome, a more direct connection between your cell phone, your laptop, and whatever it is you want to access on the internet. So is it related to the 5G, or will they simply work together to make our internet experiences much better than it is today? You just said a bit better than me again. So 5G is, is a technology. Uh, it means a lot of different things. To most people, it just means speed. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would love to say that our local mobile providers have been able to deploy IPv6 over five for 4.5G or or 3G. Okay. Um, however, both of them are working extremely hard at it, and they both tell me that it will be here very soon. Okay. Um, mobile networks by design were almost designed with IPv6 enabled, you know, so okay. I, it, I'm still at a loss as to why they launched without it, to be honest okay. with you. Um, but in both the fixed space and the mobile space, the only provider in Belize at the moment, which is my home provider, that um, that is issuing out public uh, sorry, IPv6 addresses because they're all public, yeah. um, mostly. Um, is Centaur, Centaur Networks, um, which is a cable provider. Um, my router, which I had to, I had to upgrade my router too at home, um, does what they call dual stack. So it means that every device in my home not only connects at IPv4, it also connects at IPv6. Okay. Yeah. My phone, 
Does that could work um, on anyone? Does time. it? So yeah. Sorry. Here, here we have something here. This is this is something. This is a test I did before uh, today, earlier on today. So you notice it'll tell you. Um, well, my IP before address is blacked out, and that should be so. Um, tells you my ISP is center cable. Tells me that my IPv6 address, and you see how much larger that is. Um, is native. Uh, wow. I, don't have, I, don't, I don't publish a host name. Okay. And it uses, it doesn't use Slack. That's fine. It uses okay. native IPv6. So basically what this means, this is a test site called ipv6test.com. And you go on there to test if you actually have, have the stack. So if, we, if you try to do that right now from your phone or from here at the office, because we're connected to, to, to Digi's um, network, and I'm not batching Digi because they're a great company, um, who are working diligently as well to get IPv6 yeah. on board. Uh, to do dual stack, um, we won't we won't we won't get that. We'll get a fail on the on the IPv6 and we'll okay. get a pass on the IPv4. So let's talk a little bit about of um, a couple of other things. So IPv6 has three main types of addresses. It has your public address, which is the one you see there. It has one which is a link local address, which is only within your network, within your router network at home. Okay. Yeah. And it is another very obscure one that is meant to be used by um, large organizations if they want private addressing within okay. the IPv6 space, okay. yeah, for whatever um, private okay. networks they want to create. Okay. Those are, so, so in terms of the user, users shouldn't have to do anything you know, to, to enable IPv6. Your router is supposed to automatically uh, um, support it, or if you have um, um, a managed um, endpoint yeah. or managed CPE yeah. like we have here or we have um, some um, cable providers provide, they do all the configuration for you. It should be transparent to you. Okay. So let's use a quick example right now. So I'm at home and I jump on my phone. Yes? When I jump on my phone at home, because I'm on Centaur Network, yes? When I go to YouTube, my phone connects direct to Google. Doesn't go via NAT, doesn't go via okay. two times NAT. And this is go because you're anything. on IPv6. That is correct. Great. So it's a lot, the path's a lot quicker. You have less hops. You have a much better, a um, lot less buffering, a lot better quality. And there's some other, other special things you can do with IPv6 um, that you not necessarily be, be able to do so easily with IPv4. So the, the change is not only with the protocol itself to be more secure, to, be, um, to have a lot more addresses, so don't have to worry about running out of IP addresses, which we have, essentially. Yeah. Um, you don't know it, you don't see it. Yeah. But what you do experience is a less than optimum experience as the user, yeah? So the user doesn't care, but he wants to know that when he jump on YouTube, that not a buffer and not another stop and nothing else. Correct. So the 5G gives you the speed. What the IPv6 gives you is the connectivity, is that okay. optimum connection from your endpoint to whichever endpoint in the world you want to see. Okay. So let me just rewind a little bit and talk about dual stack, just quickly. The dual stack means that you run IPv4 and IPv6 at the same time. In your network, or in my network, it'll always, because it sees IPv6, it'll always try that first. So it goes DNS, asks for a quad, quad A record, no quad A record, that means no IPv6. So then it jumps down to IPv4 and says, okay, give me a triple A record, it finds it and we move forward. Okay, great. Next so question. based on all that you have shared with us today, I just want to ask if, um, since you say the internet requires so many moving parts, do you think that in this globalized world that we should treat internet protocol as a resource that every person should have access to? Um, internet protocol as itself and the accessibility to access one's to it. populace Correct. Correct. is, uh, you can read this on very different forums, is probably the most important way to help your GDP grow. It does literally okay. everything from teaching people better using the internet online Correct. stuff to actually facilitate trade. Facilitate trade, but not only that, it gives us the ability as Belizeans to be a part of the digital economy, you know, and to be able to produce apps that use IPv6. And um, okay. I love the segment before with, with agriculture because okay. my mind has started bubbling. One of the things I haven't mentioned, which is one of the huge drivers of IPv6, is something called the Internet of Things. Yeah. Um, so that basically means your light bulb has an IP, yeah. yeah? But what it means for, for, for the likes of agriculture when we're talking about connectivity and reachability, it means that that little node that uses a sensor in the field that uses solar for power and uses IP, uses um, 5G from whichever provider or 4G from whichever provider, 
that is able to connect directly okay. back to the home networks. Not through NAT, not through double NAT or whatever else that goes, happens right now, um, directly from source to destination. And things like, um, things that, some things we haven't even thought of. I mean, geolocation is probably yeah. one of the ones that people think of a lot when yeah. they talk about Internet of Things. But basically, any kind of automation within your home, within industry, um, is um, uses the Internet of Things. Okay. And even, even your mobile phone, once you are directly connected, IPv6, to all the servers that you need to connect to. So normally on your phone, you're connected to Facebook automatically, you're connected to uh, whatever messaging services you have, um, and those things would happen a lot quicker, easier, faster on IPv6 than it ever will on IPv4, and the whole world's moving that way. Okay. So the, the, um, the, the, the driver is not only to have a better time as a user, yeah, is to actually be a part of something that we can build on. So even though it doesn't happen right now, um, the likes of uh, UB University and the high schools need to start teaching this, need to start teaching IPv6, yeah? Because my kids won't even know what IPv4 is. Yeah. Let me give you one quick one. Quick one. When we talk about games, my, my, um, my kids were the first ones to notice that something had changed in the internet when we got IPv6 at home. Because Xbox, um, all the gaming platforms, are, I'm, I'm ashamed to say how many they have, <laughs> um, but all the gaming platforms automatically started working better. They could okay. host games better. Okay. They had no problems with lag. They had no problems with, with, uh, with, with voice so lag. So from Fortnite like, and PUBG oh, to make they're, sure they're, you're on IPv6. Exactly. If you're on IPv6, well. <laughs> you've got an automatic advantage compared okay. to anybody else. That's great to know. Well, Etienne, um, thank you so much for your appearance. I'm sure thank you. all our viewers are much closer to being network admins so, now. Thanks so, for your appearance. So the, the, the only thing I'd beg everybody to do is uh, okay. please, at every opportunity, ask your provider, local provider, where it be fixed or wireless, when are you going to do IPv6? <laughs> all right. So thanks, Etienne. Thank you. Viewers, so that brings us to Etienne's contribution and appearance here on BizTech. And so we go for a final commercial break, but as soon as we return, we have exciting tech news and tech tips. Tech Talk is brought to you by the Public Utilities Commission. Welcome back to Tech Talk. Tonight's BizTech was very informative and a bit eye-opening for me. This show has really highlighted how many people and institutions in Belize have been taking advantage of technology for their benefit. But now we go to Corey for this week's edition of Tech News. If your job or business requires that you write a lot of emails, you may be desperate for a personal secretary. Not that you could afford one, but there's an app for that. Good day, everyone. I'm Corey Leslie, and I'm excited to share this week's tech news, brought to you by RFNG Insurance Company Limited. <music> Writing letters and emails can be tough, especially when you're pressed for time and can't give your all into the spell check, grammar check drama. But luckily, Google has your back. Gmail is featuring some new tools to help you save some time and frustration. The enhanced spell check and grammar suggestion functions are powered by machine learning and will begin to appear as you're typing the body of your email, much like autocorrect. There will also be a new automatic edit for common spelling mistakes without the typist needing to click anything or take any extra steps. That's not all. Apart from spelling, Gmail will now detect inaccurate verb tenses too. Much like when using Microsoft Office, Red lines will appear under your misspelled words, and blue lines will be appear below grammatic errors. And when a misspelled word has been corrected, the temporary change will also be underlined so that you can pinpoint the difference. Pretty sweet, G Suite. And speaking of amazing things being done by Google, this is the perfect time to tell you about Google Go. It's a new lightweight search app that's become available worldwide. Google Go is only seven megabytes in size and was designed to find information online for low-powered devices. The app is also able to remember your search results if you lose internet, 
so that you're up and running right where you left off when the connection is restored. Google Go can be downloaded from the Play Store and will function smoothly on any Android device running on Lollipop 5.0 and above. The app also does much more than function on low-power devices. It has an added lens function, which allows the app camera to read external text out loud. It also supports voice search and can read web content aloud as well. This is only one of the few members of the Go family, which offers functionality on low-power devices. Gmail Go offers a slimmed-down version of the email experience. Gallery Go helps you organize your photos, and Android Go creates the whole Android experience in a more compact version. So you should probably go and download that. Well, those are the only two tech news that I have to share this week. As we speak, we may have all heard about the uncontrollable fires in the Amazon. Updates are coming in every minute, and I just read that technology can be one of the tools used to fight the fire. Be sure to tune in next week for tech news on that and more. So until then, adios. Thanks for all the Google Tech News, Corey. As someone who uses Gmail every day, I have seen and have grown to love the digital co-author when writing emails. It feels like I simply need to put the first two words and my G assistant starts suggesting the rest. Well, now we turn it over to Alana for this week's Tech Tips. We lock our doors, check them twice, install cameras, build fences, all for security. So why don't we secure our accounts with the same vigor? Hello viewers, my name is Alana and I'm about to give you some super helpful tech tips sponsored by Digi. Security is something that's constantly on everyone's mind. It's one of the most basic human needs. Safety and peace of mind are invaluable and for good reason. That's why sometimes people can be a little skeptical of the internet, that seemingly lawless wild web. We often have very precious information on our accounts about our finances, our personal lives, and some pretty embarrassing pictures from high school. Although I've talked before about how to be sure that your password is airtight and uncrackable, a little extra layer of security couldn't hurt. Two-factor authentication, also known as two-step verification, is a method that most sites allow you to opt into. It's like having two locks on your door. When you enable two-step verification, you can enter your password like normal as the first step. The second step comes in when the site that you are logging onto sends a randomized code to your phone via SMS or to your email. Once you receive this code, you enter it to complete your login process. This method of logging in takes a little more time, but it's much more secure. Even if someone has guessed your password, they won't be able to access your account unless they have that second code, which usually expires if it's not used quickly enough. The code also changes every single time you log in to ensure that your data stays protected. Your email server and social media websites most likely have this option. Try checking your account settings and looking under a privacy tab to see if this method of login is available for you. Next up, one of my personal favorite things about technology is how much more easily accessible it makes everything. In this world, not everyone has the same abilities, but whether you or your loved one has a visibility, mobility, or hearing impairment, your phone has great features that can help you out. For instance, if you know your mom can never read her text messages or Facebook posts without straining her eyes, search for accessibility in her phone settings. Both Android and Apple have options to make font sizes larger. You can also change your phone's contrast settings to help with eye strain, enable speech so words can be read aloud by a voice, and a variety of other visibility assisting functions. If you know someone who can't hear when they get a notification, Turn on LED flash so that your phone's flashlight can give them a visible cue that someone is calling or texting or even like their latest Instagram post. You can even hook up your phone to a hearing aid via Bluetooth if your hearing device has that option. Life in 2019 means that everyone should be able to enjoy 
all the fantastic uses technology has to offer. Well, we've come to the end of another segment of Tech Tips. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again soon. Really nice, Alana. I know for sure that the accessibility options on a phone can help out a lot, even for people without impairments. Since I have a baby who is in a deep sleeper, I have to keep my phone on mute since even the vibrations will wake her. So the LED flashes have become helpful for me at night. And of course, the larger font sizes are essential for most of us in the eyeglasses wearing community. Well, that's it for this installment of Tech Talk. I would once again like to thank our guests, CEO Jose Alpuche and Milagro Matos from the Ministry of Agriculture and Etienne Sharp. Well, tune in again next Tuesday for more Tech Talk. Until then, good night. <laughs>